Thank you very much. Um, it's a great uh, pleasure and honor to be here at this uh, birthday conference for Sasha Mercuriev, and I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. And I'd also like to thank Sasha for uh, leading and developing the field which we all work in so marvelously over these years, and many happy returns of the birthday. <clears throat> so what I'm uh, going to talk about today is uh, joint work with uh, Alexei Anyanevsky. and uh, Vanya Pani. So, uh, as I ex explained to Professor Sayre, we um, rather shamelessly have used his uh, name in this. Uh, we're not proving any finiteness theorems, but what we are doing is um, proving for the motivic stable homotopy category, or rather its uh, rational localization, uh, consequences which are reminiscent of the consequences that Sayre's finiteness theorem have for the classical stable homotopy category, also with rational coefficients. <clears throat> so let me begin with the classical story, so I can, uh, so you can see the analogy. Um, and I also apologize uh, to the experts here in uh, motivic homotopy theory, so I hope to give uh, some background to the non-experts, so waste a lot of time with that for the experts, but so I apologize. So, first of all, the classical story. So, uh, it has to do with homotopy theory, and homotopy theory studies spaces, so we'll let SPC denote a category of spaces, and uh, you have some freedom uh, to do this, but uh, maybe a nice model would be simplicial sets. And then we also have the pointed version. Okay, and then uh, you have the homotopy categories. You take spaces and you invert uh, the weak equivalences. So a map of spaces is a weak equivalence if F induces isomorphisms on pi n for all n and all choices of base point in case n is at least 1. And then we also have a pointed version. <clears throat> okay. So, um, yeah, I mean, one of the basic uh, invariants here are the, then the homotopy groups of spheres. Um, so here's sort of a collection of the basic results on elementary results, or say the first results we know about homotopy groups of spheres. So the first one is we get a zero. This is if m is less than n. And uh, this is not so difficult. I guess there are a number of different ways to prove this one by measure theory. You basically have to show that the image of an SM and an SN does not, uh, is not surjective. And then you can remove a point and contract things. OK. And then we have a consequence of the Horevich theorem, which we get a z for m equals n. And then we have the start of the computation. So these are uh, the results of Serre. Um, you have this funny case. You have z plus a finite group in case uh, n is even. 
and m is 2n minus 1. And you also have, in all other cases, it's a finite group. Okay. So. Now, we'd also like to know what happens uh, stably. So you can apply a suspension operation. And that's covered by uh, Freudenthal suspension theorem. That uh, when you take the suspension map, This is an isomorphism for m less than 2n minus 1. And it's a surjection for m equals 2n minus 1. Um, maybe I should, since it's a, the z in this funny case is, is rather surprising, let me just mention one example. I mean, the class's example is the hop map. where you go from S3, which you view as C2 minus the origin, to S2, maybe I call it something eta, which you view as CP1, by the usual map sending a line through the origin to the line through the origin, CP1. Okay. So XY. Okay, so that gives you the Z, and then the stabilization says that um, that maps surjectively, that actually generates uh, pi 3 of S2, and then maps surjectively onto um, pi 4 of S3, and becomes uh, two torsion, and then stabilizes after that. So similar uh, constructions tell you, you have the following. You put these together, you get the following stable result. which tells you that, um, well, if you take, let me define the stable, just use a notation here, of the sphere spectrum, it's the limit of m pi, maybe I should make it, oh, let me make an n here, pi n plus n. N. So, and this is equal to zero for n less than zero, z for n equals zero, and it's then finite for n bigger than zero. So, okay, so let me just uh, quickly remind you of the, there's a category where this is all uh, taking place. Uh, so the stable theory. takes place in the stable homotopy category, where you systematically stabilize the homotopy groups in this way, and you don't have to do it just by suspending. Um, you can form an object, a spectrum. This is what enables you to make a stable homotopy group. So you have a sequence of pointed spaces plus uh, bonding maps, which map the suspension from the nth guy. This is just what you get when you take En smash S1 to En plus 1. And then you can define the stable homotopy groups of E, again, as a limit. We use these bonding maps to perform the stabilization. So this S is the so-called suspension spectrum of S0. So if you have a pointed space, you could, like S0 is a point with an additional base point, then you can take its suspension. That would be S1, the next suspension, S2, et cetera. 
and so that agrees with this notation. More generally, if you can take x to be a pointed space, then you have its suspension spectrum, which is just x, suspension of x, etc. And then the homotopy groups of the suspension spectrum are the usual stable homotopy groups of x. Okay. Now, the, this stable homotopy category is not just for talking about stable homotopy groups. It uh, was built, it has nice structural properties. This is a triangulated tensor category. The tensor is usually written by smash product. And um, <clears throat> the objects in here, the spectra, represent uh, cohomology. So if you have some space x, or pointed space x, and you have some spectrum, then you can form the E cohomology of x. And this, just by definition, is the maps in the category from the suspension spectrum of x to the suspension of E. And I should say that triangulated category, of course, has a shift functor, and that's just the suspension functor. The way you've constructed this gadget, um, I didn't tell you how to, what the weak equivalences are, so maybe I should say um, SH is you take spectra and you invert the so-called stable weak equivalences. And that's just a map which induces an isomorphism on the stable homotopy groups. Okay. So this gives you E cohomology. Of some point in space X. Now, of course, we have just regular singular cohomology that you can define that without going through this uh, rather abstract construction. So what about singular cohomology? This is represented by so A here is an abelian group by the so-called eilenberg maclean spectrum of A. And here what you do, uh, well, without saying what it is as a spectrum, this is characterized by the property that pi n of the spectrum, the stable pi n, is equal to 0 for n different from 0, and it's A for n equal to 0. And then you can show that there's a canonical isomorphism of the usual singular cohomology uh, with coefficients in A with the EM of A cohomology as defined here abstractly. And this construction actually extends to an uh, exact functor, the eilenberg maclean functor, from the derived, I'm going to write it in the funny order here, because it's a right adjoint, the derived category of abelian groups. You extend this from groups, abelian groups to complexes of abelian groups to the stable homotopy category. And this thing gets identified with the homotopy category of modules over this eilenberg maclean spectrum applied to the integers. This turns out to have a nice ring structure. And you can talk about an appropriate category of modules over this spectrum. And this becomes the homotopy category of modules. So that gives you, this eilenberg maclean functor gives you a functor this way. I said it's a right adjoint. The left adjoint, this is, you can think of this as a forgetful functor in some sense. Here you have a EMZ module. You forget the EMZ module structure, and you just have a spectrum. And uh, in the other direction, well, a forgetful functor from modules to, say, sets, the functor in the other direction is just the free uh, module, so that's uh, just this. You smash with, maybe I should smash on the left. So that's an adjoint pair of functors. And now 
the Sayers finiteness theorem comes in, the, for this tensor structure, the sphere spectrum is the unit object. And of course, in this category, EMZ is the unit object. And so here we have a comparison. Uh, so if you compare the stable homotopy groups here and here for A equals Z, they're almost the same up to some finite group, right? So what you can say is the unit map is a rational weak equivalence. So after tensoring with Q, it gives you an isomorphism on the stable homotopy groups. And what that tells you, if you that these adjoint functors give uh, an equivalence that if you take the stable homotopy category and localize with respect to Q, this is then equivalent to this category localized at Q, which is just the derived category of Q vector spaces. So the, uh, even though these categories are definitely not equivalent, there, um, you can sort of measure the failure of these to be equivalent is uh, in some sense given by the Steenrod algebra. If you look at this unit object here, consider it in here, there are lots of interesting maps in this category which don't come from here. So in this case, this, this map in this direction turns out to be a faithful functor, but it's not full. And the, the existence of these extra maps gives you by sort of a Postnikov tower construction tells you how you can build new objects out of complexes of abelian groups which themselves are not in the derived category because you have patching maps, gluing maps which exist in SH but don't exist in the derived category of abelian groups. But all those extra data vanish, they're just torsion information, so they vanish when you uh, pass to the rational completion and then the two categories become the same. Okay, so that's a quick overview of classical homotopy theory. Um, let's see what happens in the motivic setting. So this is brilliant uh, construction of uh, Voivodsky and Morel. You want to uh, somehow expand this stable, this uh, homotopy theory uh, to include the classical case in some sense, but also include uh, categories of varieties, uh, schemes over, say, a, a base scheme. I'll just look at the case of uh, a base field and probably I should restrict at various points to a field of characteristic zero. So let's <laughs> keep that as a hidden hypothesis just to be on the safe side, but okay. So what do we do? We replace spaces with the category of spaces over K. So we have our algebraic geometry is contained in the category of smooth varieties, or smooth finite type. Somebody doesn't like varieties in the audience. Smooth finite type. K separated, of course. K schemes. And we want to somehow put this into the picture, and the, the nice way to do it is you just take this to be the category of space-valued. Yes, certainly, yeah. Yeah, that's right. So that the, you'll see. Be patient. <laughs> I know, I know, I understand. So the category here comes in as a parameter space. You take uh, pre-sheaves on this category with values in spaces. Okay? So, um, in some sense, if you take the parameter category to be a point, then we're in the classical setting. We now look at parameterized families of spaces parameterized by the category of smooth varieties. So that, uh, this actually mixes the two categories together because of course we can put spaces inside here as the constant pre-sheaf. So uh, we have a sphere here, Sn, just the constant uh, pre-sheaf. But you can take 
Appreciative of discrete spaces, not constant, namely the representable presheaves, and that embeds smooth varieties into here by Yoneda. So both of these categories sit inside this category. And the really nice thing is, I mean, formally, this category has all limits and co-limits, because you can take limits and co-limits in the value category. Just do that point-wise. So, for, so you, can, uh, yeah, you can take quotients in this category, or you could take v to the infinity in this category, for example. It's, a, it's the limit presheaf associated to the presheaves here. So this category here has co-limits and limits. So quotients, products, whatever you like. Uh, perform pointwise. So you can construct the following uh, monster. Well, of course, there's also the pointed version. This is And if you have a variety, a, sm a smooth scheme over K, you can always add an ad a disjoint base point by just taking the disjoint union with spec K. That's uh, adding a disjoint base point. So if you have uh, X, say, a smooth variety, then you can do things like you can take the suspension of X plus. This is a space, a pointed space over K. It's just equal to S1 smash X plus. It makes perfectly good sense. OK, good. <clears throat> or you can, uh, if you have, say, Y inside of X, then you can take X modulo Y. That's a pointed space. This is in. just defined as a presheaf, the presheaf quotient. Well, uh, maybe I should say something about, uh, now you have a homotopy category. And so the art here, this is, this is in some sense uh, not a very helpful construction. But it gets you started. You have to say, what are the weak equivalences? What do I want to invert? And the weak equivalences come in uh, two flavors. Um, let me use this here. So are generated by two types. First of all, you have a map. Now, let's say you have spaces over K such that uh, for all these Navich stocks, so you, there's a topology on the category So if you have a presheaf uh, and you have a topology with points, uh, you can take the stock of the presheaf. That'll be a space. In this case, this means you take the uh, Nisnevich, uh, the Henselization of the local ring of x in big X. That's a limit object, and you can apply the space to the uh, limit. Take the limit here. And that gives you a map of spaces, and this should be a weak equivalence. So a Nisnevich local weak equivalence. And the second type are you make the affine line contractible by saying x cross the affine line by the projection should be isomorphic to x. And then there's, a, there's some technical problems in showing that you really can uh, generate a nice set of uh, weak equivalences from this generating set, but that's been done. And then that defines the A1 weak equivalences. So maybe I should just mention uh, some nice facts about this category. Uh, yeah, nice facts. Some interesting.
So we often think of uh, the projective line as a two-sphere, P1 being CP1, but in this setting that would be a mistake, or half a mistake. Oops. So, for example, in, in uh, H of K, the projective line is no longer discrete. It's the suspension of GM, where GM is the pointed scheme. You take the affine line minus the origin pointed with 1. So this is P1, let's say, sorry, P1, say, pointed by 1 like, or could use infinity, it doesn't really matter. So the fact that you take this A1 localization, I mean, you see this by covering P1 by two A1s, their intersection is GM, and since we've made this uh, first type of weak equivalence, this Nisnevich local weak equivalence, we get a Meyer via Torres uh, sequence describing P1 as being patched together along two copies of A1 uh, joined together on a GM, but A1 is contractible, so we contract the two A1s to a point, and that gives us the suspension of GM. You contract GM to a point in two different ways, and that's the suspension. Okay, so uh, there's a note, there are various notations, unfortunately. So I should say, this thing then somehow looks like a sphere, but it's a one way to wait, write it, it's S1 twisted by 1. Maybe that's a bad idea. I'm just going to use this. But the other notation, S21. OK, so there's a bunch of notations. This S1 twisted by 1 will actually be useful for this lecture to point out the parallels between the classical case. So this is, this is for today only, this notation. Let me uh, explain why these various notations come in. There's a realization you can take C points or you can take R points. If you take C points, then GM becomes equivalent to S1. This becomes C minus the origin. That's uh, homotopy equivalent to S1. And then this becomes an S2. It's the usual CP1 is S2. But if you take real points, then you get the real projective line and also GM just becomes R minus the origin, which is contractible to an S0, and this becomes an S1. So the fact that you have this 1 here, so that's the 2 is because of the complex points, and the 1 is because of weight 1, but if you prefer the real points, then you can do it that way. Anyway, you see that the existence of this sort of Tate part in the sphere tells you that the sphere varies. Uh, it's not, no longer a constant object, it varies. It's a variable sphere. So we have a similar notation, SA of B, I'll write, for the usual sphere wedged with GM uh, to the B. And there's a, this is also, to keep track of the complex dimension, this is also written as SA plus B comma B. So sorry for the double notation. OK, so that's one difference. The other difference is, what about homotopy groups? get replaced with, so this has one did x, becomes bi-graded, and not homotopy groups, because we've changed the parameter space from a point to the category. We have homotopy sheaves. So in my today-only notation, we can define pi a1 a of some space x, pointed space x, comma b, the weight b, as the pre-sheaf associated to and in the classical notation this would be maybe not the standard notation pi a plus b b of x 
associated to taking some U, smooth variety over K, going to homotopy classes of maps of an S A B smash U plus into X. Okay, so these become the interesting objects. And in fact, um, a map of spaces is a weak equivalence exactly when it gives you an isomorphism on these homotopy sheaves for all A and B for which they're defined. Okay. And uh, so, what about spheres? We have the Hopf map. It's the interesting map of spheres. Eta, and I just wrote it down for you already. It's A2 minus the origin mapping to P1. So P1, I, I said, was an S1 of weight 1, and this thing turns out to be an S1 of weight 2. Right? If you take the complex points, it becomes an S3. If you take the real points, it's an S1. The R2 minus the origin is an S1. <coughs> OK, that's the algebraic Hopf map. Good. So, so quite remarkably, uh, Morel was able to, I erased it, was able to cover the first two points in the classical results from homotopy theory in this setting. So let me recall Morel's theorem. So first of all, let's look at, how do I, so this, this is where the somewhat non-standard notation will be useful. So first of all, this is equal to zero. So this, remember, this is not a group, this is a sheaf. So this is a statement about sheaves. And this is if m is less than n, but just like in the topological case. So the first interesting case is when n is equal to m. And then you get something different. So yeah, I think this is always true. Uh, Q of b. Here we have to assume uh, n is at least 2 b is at least 1. We're going to talk about a stable result soon, so it's not too important. And what is this? This is the sheaf of Milnervit k-theory. I'll put a little underline to indicate sheaf in degree q minus r. Yes? Yeah, so this means here, oh, maybe I didn't, did I say it? Yeah, I guess I didn't say it, sorry. Yeah, oh, I did say it. So pi, I'll say here, what this means is, is the pre-sheaf associated, if you take some u, you send it to the maps. So this means you're smashing u with an m sphere twisted by b. And now we're mapping into an n sphere twisted by q. And this guy here, this m-sphere, means I take just a usual n-sphere and smash it with gm. It's a weighted m-sphere with weight b. Is that OK? I mean, not that it's OK, but <laughs> is it understandable. OK. That's the notation. Yeah, it's OK, everybody? Ah, yeah, Q minus, there's no, ah, there's, so somebody wrote something really stupid here. I don't know what this is. Yeah, here, make this an R, because Q and R, that's better than Q and B, yeah. 
and make this an, I could make this an R. It doesn't. Sorry. Yeah, is that better? Have, no? Yeah, but it's correct. Yeah, no, so now it should be okay. No more B. Yeah, okay, okay, so it's an R, my God. Give me a, give me a break here. Now it's better, okay? It doesn't, it doesn't. They're just being ridiculous. They're just being, I made a little mistake and now they're giving me a real hard time about it. So it doesn't make any difference. You're absolutely right. Yeah, no, it doesn't make any difference. So in order to explain this, I should say what this thing is. So let me explain that. <coughs> Maybe I start over here to give myself a little blackboard space. Oh, maybe I should just say it kind of stops there, more or less. I mean, there are nice results for uh, m equals n plus 1 and m equals n plus 2 due to Asak and Fazel, but it's complicated. So I'll just put a question mark here for M bigger than that. Okay. So that's you know, page one. <laughs> okay. So what's this? This is a sheaf. Let me tell you what it's value. So a sheaf in the Nisnevich topology has values at all uh, points stocks of points, in particular you can take the generic point of a variety and then you get a field finitely generated over the base field. So let me tell you what this thing is on a field. This is an algebra, the graded associative algebra with generators. Two kinds of generators. We have one generator in degree one for all u, a unit in the field, and we have another element, eta, which is supposed to represent the algebraic Hopf map. This is of degree minus one. Doesn't depend, it's always there, doesn't depend on the field. And so what are the relations? These relations will remind you of the relations from Milner K theory, but they're a little more complicated. So, and relations, so let's call zero. First, the eta, the two types of generators commute. Relation one, you have a Steinberg relation. You have, it's not additive in the, it's not additive in the unit. So it's almost additive. There's an error term. This is how it differs from Milner K theory. And then there's one additional relation which is tantamount to killing the hyperbolic form. You'll see in a minute uh, two Okay. So some facts about this. If you take a unit, then we have this thing. This is the one-dimensional quadratic form. So this would be in the grotendieck witt group of F. And sending these generate the grotendieck witt group, at least if the characteristic is not two. So sending uh, this symbol to this symbol uh, not, that's wrong, to this 
thing. This is in, this is going to be something of degree zero, defines an isomorphism of the Grotendieck Witt group of F with this Milner Witt zero of F. And if you send U to eta to the R times one plus eta U, this is now in Milner Witt minus R of F defines an iso of uh, the Witt group. This last relation kills the hyperbolic form for all r at least one. So it's very close related to quadratic forms in the zero and negative degree and in the positive degree <coughs> So I'm rapidly running out of time here. So for r bigger than 1, we have an exact sequence. So it's pretty clear if you send eta to zero, you just get a presentation of Milner K theory. And that's this map, it's just eta goes to zero. And the kernel turns out to be the n plus, f the r plus first power of the augmentation ideal in the Grotendieck Witt ring of F. So you get a mixture of, if you like, classical algebraic geometry with quadratic forms. And that all appears in the homotopy. So then it extends to a sheaf. chief of algebras, graded algebras, on smooth varieties over K for the Nisnevich topology. And that's exactly what appears here as the, so to speak, zeroth uh, homotopy groups, zeroth stem. OK. So yeah, is there a question? So we can stabilize and as you might suspect, you don't stabilize with respect to S1. You stabilize with respect to S11. So you stabilize with respect to S1 and with respect to GM simultaneously, if you like, with respect to P1. So, um, right? So you get stabilization maps and, um, right, uh, suspension. Thank you. And so you have a category of S11 spectra, and it's, you know, what you'd expect, plus a map of the suspension of En to En plus 1. And I won't write the S here. You have stable Xi's for an E. So 
A map will be a stable weak, A1 weak equivalence if it's an isomorphism on these stable sheaves, and that leads to the category, the motivic stable homotopy category, where you take the spectra and invert the stable A1 weak equivalences. Okay, so um, having said that, we can take uh, Morel's theorem, and it tells us something about the stable sheaves of the motivic stable sphere spectrum. Yeah, it's like on ramified theory. You define a you know tame symbol map. I think it's due to Morel. I'm not really sure. Maybe someone will correct me on that. Yeah, I think it's due to Morel. Okay, so for example, uh, you have for any space pointed space over K, you have the infinite it's one one suspension spectrum. And if you have some E, some uh, S11 spectrum over K, and a space here, you can define the E. Yeah, so now, <laughs> e, now you're going to really hate me. Cohomology, maybe I'll put the B here. It's even better. It's the maps. So I should say that the normal notation here looks like this. Pardon me? Yes. Yes, thank you. And this category, SH K, is a triangulated tensor. Just as in the classical case, thank you. Okay, so Morel's theorem gives us the stable result that when we take, <clears throat> so for example, we have the sphere spectrum over K, that's the infinite suspension spectrum of S naught over K. This is just two points again. <clears throat> And we have, if you take the zeroth, well, let's say you take the A of this one, K, B is equal to zero if A is less than zero, and it's equal to the milner witt sheaf in degree minus B for A equals zero. <coughs> okay, so you might ask, what's the analog of ordinary cohomology? So ordinary cohomology gets replaced with motivic cohomology. Yeah, replaced is maybe, maybe it's not the right thing. It's not clear, but one thing you can do is you can replace it with that. In other words, there's a similar pair of adjoint functors. You take Voyevodsky's category, big triangulated category of motives, There's a A1 Eilenberg-McLean functor in this direction, 
and at least in characteristic zero, uh, this is the same thing as homotopy uh, category of modules over z of zero. So there's a Tate object, z of zero, in here. Um, and this thing is the same as the homotopy category of modules over that eilenberg maclean spectrum. And you have an adjoint functor in the other direction, which is the same, the free functor. So, <clears throat> however, now the situation becomes different. It's formally similar. But what's the difference? And now we're getting to the point of my talk, finally. OK. What happens with the Q localization? Pardon me? Uh, not known, as far as I know. May, may even be a counterexample, but as far as I know, it's, it's not known. I don't know if there's a counterexample offhand. Maybe anyone in the audience want to jump in? The, let me put it this way. The proof in the classical case does not work in this case, as far as I know. So, <clears throat> so, what about the Q localization? Well, there's already a problem. If you take the unit map from the sphere spectrum to this guy, and look at it on even just on pi zero zero. Well, let's look at it on pi zero. Um, R. It's the map. Turns out it's the map, the Milner Witt sheaf, to the Milner sheaf. You can compute the corresponding groups here, and you get the Milner sheaves, not the Milner Witt sheaves. So, in other words, this eta goes to zero. So, if you take R equals zero, then you have the grotendieck witt group and evaluate on K, you have the grotendieck witt group of K going by the rank homomorphism, dimension homomorphism, to Z. And, uh, well, if the field has finite two cohomological dimension, that's not so bad. If you invert two, it's an isomorphism. So, an iso after adding one-half if the two-cohomological dimension of the field is finite, but not in general. So, for example, for K equals Q or R or field with a real embedding, you have extra factors corresponding to signature maps in the grotendieck witt group, and this will be not even rationally an isomorphism. So you can't hope to get a rational equivalence of these categories. What you can do, this is... Uh, Morel has the following. So this comes from the fact that uh, these spheres vary, right? So we had our P. So we had our S11, S11. We have the exchange of factors map. What happens if we take C points over C points? This is no problem. Over C points, you have S2 being exchanged with S2. And this is just homotopic to the identity map. But over R points, you have S1, S1, and this is homotopic to minus the identity. So this tau extends to an involution on the sphere spectrum, which sometimes is the identity and sometimes is minus the identity. So it actually breaks this up. So the sphere spectrum, if you look at it, let's say invert two, but let me just go quickly to the rationals, it's equal to a plus part times a minus part. 
you can split this up into sort of eigenspaces. And the theorem of um, Szynski and de Glees, they recover the classical result replacing the derived category of abelian groups with motives if you restrict to the plus part. Yeah, no, it's not smash. It's really a direct sum. It's like you have a, think of it, you're in a category and you have the unit splitting up into a sum of two pieces. And since it's a ring, I write it as a product. It's not, not smash. Sum or product, okay. So theorem of Szynski de Glees, maybe I should say, since I, I just said it, but the sphere spectrum is the unit in the category, so I should have written it here, that says that SH of k, you just have to invert 2, but let me write it with q coefficients, is a plus part, direct sum, a minus part. So the plus part looks more like classical homotopy theory in this sense, the theorem of Szynski de Glees. Maybe I should also say it was also stated by Morel, is that the unit map induces a weak equivalence with the plus part. And that tells you that the it's isomorphic to Voyevatsky's category of motives after a Q localization. Maybe I'll put a Q here just to be precise. So maybe I should now mention <laughs> our main theorem, since almost out of time. So the unit map uh, yeah. So there is a theory called KW. I'll say what this is. This is you take KO theory and you invert the algebraic Hopf map. So I have to write something here, KW0. And thereby, so I'll have to explain this a little bit. Okay, you have this minus part. This part I can explain is equivalent with a homotopy category of modules over just the sheaf of Witt groups, sheaf of Witt rings. Okay, so this is just a sheaf of commutative rings on well the zero the zero means rational but okay doesn't exist unless you rationalize but okay it's a notation yeah nevertheless yeah it's rational <coughs> okay so this is just the ah this is this is rational you take the sheaf of wit rings with rational coefficients and you can take modules over the sheaf of rings you uh, have its complexes, homotopy category, and that gives a description of this category. So in sense, it's simpler than motives. So I'm out of time, so I should just say that the, uh, say a word about the proof, you follow Szynski degrees, and the crucial, so there are two crucial points, 
So Szczynski degrees go by taking algebraic K theory with rational coefficients and splitting it up into its atoms eigenspaces. And they show that this, this guy here, this is sort of a riemann roch type theorem, is equivalent to this weight zero part. And the crucial fact that you get out of this uh, description is that this implies that the self-smash product is isomorphic, well, the smash product is isomorphic to itself. So what we do is we rely on computations of Anjanevsky for this operations and cooperations on this eta inverted uh, KO. So our result uses computations of KW star star KW and KW smash plus of Anjanevsky to this guy allows us to decompose KW again as a direct sum rationally. Thank you. So I'll put the Q here and then the this guy here is essentially the same as the sheaf. You have to sort of add twists up and down, but it doesn't affect anything. And you get this crucial identity. OK, since I'm more than out of time, I can't say any more. Uh, but thank you for your attention. Sorry for going over. <laughs> So I should say thank you for that question because it gives me the chance to tie this in with uh, Sarah's results, at least in the stable case. So a, a corollary of this, if you take pi, the rational homotopy sheaves are equal to, of course, zero of A is less than zero. They're equal to. Um, you can think of it this way. They're equal to this uh, for A equals 0. They're equal to and uh, so for A bigger than 0, you just have the minus A minus B cubed. Yeah. So this gives you, right? I think this is correct. Yeah, for the minus, uh, the weight zero ones? No, I mean. Uh, yeah, okay, you want weight zero. So. Uh, no, I mean, you get the Witt group, you always get the Witt group. For A equals zero, ah, uh, you want uh, B equals zero. Okay, so what is this for B equals zero? Thank you, yeah. So this guy will be zero. This, so you get Grotendieck Witt group rationally 
for a equals zero, and you get zero for a not zero. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's why. That's why you have co-authors. Thank you. Ah. Hmm. Is it? Anybody know? I don't know. I mean, the, the only non-zero part would be here. So I guess that's a statement about motivic cohomology. And so it should be, sounds like it's, if you have, probably if you have finite, uh, if your field has finite uh, transcendence degree over Q, then the answer would be yes, and if not, then the answer would be no. If you take this over C, then of course the Milner K theory is not nilpotent. Right? You can just multiply. I mean, an individual element would be nilpotent, yeah. But you wouldn't have nilpotence of the whole group. Are there any more questions? If not, thank you very much again. Thank you.